That worked a little better. <laughs> let's, um, let's go ahead and get started, please. Let's open up with a prayer. So we pray. Almighty God and everlasting Father, we thank you for gathering us here today on this joyous day. And we ask your blessing now upon us as we continue to study and to consider your hand guiding history in preparing for Christ. And then your hand continuing to work throughout our lives to bring us to faith and keep us with you. So grant us your grace now in our time of study. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, before we get jump into things, um, there's some more copies. If you didn't get one last week, there's more of those um, thick, like 50-page copies um, of this uh, historical overview of the time in between the Testaments. A quick note um, while we're kind of getting things prepared is, um, and this ties into what we're doing, today is, for a large group of Christians, today is Easter. Yeah. So, which which group of Christians celebrate Easter today? Anybody know? Greek Orthodox. Yeah, the, the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox churches. Why are they doing it today and not several weeks ago, five weeks ago, like we did? Anybody know? Calendar. Calendar. They are basing their dates off the Julian calendar while we do ours off the Gregorian calendar. All right? So, since we talked a little bit about that, that's, um, that's a little bit of the differences. So, sometimes those dates actually align. Because you're also um, considering um, those calendars are more based on a solar calendar. But does anybody know how we date, how we would date Easter? Lunar. Lunar, Lunar calendar. Mm -hmm. So for us, Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... We have the equinox, we have full moon cycles and the lunar cycles, we have a weekly cycle, um, and um, using the Gregorian calendar, where the Eastern Orthodox do something similar, but they are using the Julian calendar. Okay? So sometimes, this is about as far apart as we're going to get celebrating Easter, is what we're doing now. Right? And sometimes they actually fall on the same Sunday depending upon when the full moon is and when the equinox is. Okay? So, the easiest way to figure all this stuff out is you just do an internet search and say, when is Easter? <laughs> yes. Yep, theirs moves around just like ours does. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, I, when I was in high school, um, I lived in a town in Oregon called Woodburn. And at that time, the town was about 25 or 30,000 people. And around 18% of the town was Russian. Um, and you had two, two waves of Russian um, immigration. And there's pockets of Russian communities all up and down, um, really kind of from Vancouver, B.C., all the way down into northern California, and so some came over in the um, in the 19, early 1900s, around the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, and then some came. Um, there was a big wave in the late 80s and the early 90s, as well. Right? So right down the street from us, we had um, this group called. Um, it's basically a denomination. Um, in our language, a denomination of Eastern Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox, which is called Old Believers. And um, for them, um, think they're, they're almost comparable to like Amish and Mennonites, right? Very um, handmade clothing, um, conservative dress, men don't shave. Um, that kind of thing. And they would celebrate Easter um, um, all of Holy Week and all the week after. And so whenever we had, um, um, whenever it was Easter week, 
for them, they were always excused from school for religious holidays. So they missed at least a week, if not two. They made everybody else jealous. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a week off. Yeah. yeah. So, um, anyway. Well, you know, we used to always, in public schools, get Good Friday off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, that's, you know, that's a, a consequence now of less than 50% of, of Americans who attend church, of any sort, in any religion, okay? So, um, yeah, that's, that's a consequence of the de-Christianization of our culture. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, this is um, this kind of stuff ties in actually very well with what we're looking at, with what we're studying, because this is not the first time in history where God's people have lived um, and struggled with um, a culture that doesn't recognize God. And um, there's a lot to be learned by going back in history to see how God's people handled the living in cultures that are. Um, where where the faith is prominent, where it wanes, where the culture is apathetic, and where the culture is actually hostile. Um, and I think there's a lot. Um, there really is a lot for us to learn from that. To say, so how are we going to prepare our children and our grandchildren in a culture that may not be Christian and may not recognize um, or appreciate or even allow? Certain um, certain Christian practices. I mean, just um, so um, that's something I think all parents, especially parents with um, young kids, are thinking about a lot nowadays. Right? It's just how do we prepare kids for this world that seems to be draft changing faster than it has in um, in more recent memory. So um, we're going to look at some of this. So if you have your handout. Um, we're going to be in the section called Divided Rule, the Judeans under the Ptolemies. I believe that's on page 12 of your handout. Okay. So um, that's primarily what we're going to look at um, and where we're going to start. Now, um, we are going to be getting to the Apocrypha soon. Uh, maybe not today. The, um, the purpose of this is I want, we want to set the historical, kind of the historical groundwork, and then we'll go back and look at some of the Apocrypha stuff. And um, that'll, that'll give us a better understanding of what's in there and why. All right? So um, right now, where we're going to look at the divided rule, Again, the Judeans under the Ptolemies. So this is um, around the year 323 to 181. So 323 is when uh, Alexander the Great dies. Okay? And when Alexander dies, um, well, just looking at that, um, that first paragraph there in the handout, if you have it. If not, just listen, please. It says, when Alexander died in 323 B.C., he left no heir old enough to rule in his place. <laughs> Roxana, Alexander's Bactrian wife, bore him a son, but there were a number of relatives of Alexander, either by blood or marriage, who hoped to rule Alexander's empire. Even before the burial of the great conqueror, the battle for his kingdom began. For a while, Perdiccas, one of Alexander's generals, endeavored to keep the empire together for Alexander's unborn son, Philip Aridaeus, the demented half-brother of Alexander, was proclaimed a titular king until Alexander's son would be of age to rule. And this did not last very long. Well, that's where she's from, this Bactria. Yeah. So um, I believe that is um, um, s sort of around the area of Babylon. So I could be wrong, but I think that's where that is. Has anybody seen the movie that came out I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago called Alexander? Oh, yeah. That was able to great with, um, I don't remember Brad Pitt. No, not Brad. That was Troy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, 
There's a movie that came out 10 or 15 years ago called Alexander. Don't don't watch it. It's not a good movie. <laughs> it's honest. And it's not, historically, it's not great. So, yeah, skip that. Really yeah. 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 Okay, next. Um, just kind of going on. The successors of Alexander contested, um, contested the possession of his empire. One of them, Cassander, murdered Roxanna and her son. Um, this kind of thing's normal. I mean, it seems normal. But yeah, it's pretty normal. Um, by 315 BC, Ptolemy, Cassander, and Lysimachus formed an alliance aimed at thwarting the ambitious designs of a Macedonian noble and Agonis to become the sec a second Alexander. The following chart shows how Alexander is divided. So, here's the big thing. Alexander's kingdom, um, the empire then, is divided up among four of his generals. Okay? Um, Cassander has Macedonia. Okay, so that's Greek, that um, Greece, Macedonia. Ptolemy um, gets Egypt. The P is silent, so it's Ptolemy. Um, Syria has um, Lysimachus, and Babylonia has Seleucus and Nicanor. Okay, now for for our sake, um, basically, I'm gonna we're gonna kind of skip some things here, but. Um, um, let, let me read on a little bit, and I'm going to skip a bunch of this section because I just want to highlight on a couple of things here. So, right, I'm right underneath that chart that's on your handout. It says, many students of the Bible believe that this division happened in fulfillment to the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 4. And as soon as he is risen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others beside him. So that's a very common um, idea about the interpretation of Daniel chapter 11, is that it's talking about Alexander's empire and the division of that between these four generals. Okay? So, uh, going on. The destruction of Alexander's empire led to a renewal of the age-long struggle for the possession of Judea by the Egyptians and the, Me and the Mesopotamians. Okay? Because those are, that's kind of what they're surrounded by. Okay? Ptolemy invaded Egypt in 320 B.C. He surprised Jerusalem on a Sabbath day. Pretty smart, right? Everybody's in their homes, they're not working, and they're not doing anything. So he surprised them on a Sabbath, took the city without resistance. In 315, Ptolemy's rival, Antiochus, took Judea. But after the Battle of Gaza in 312, Ptolemy reclaimed it. Seleucus, who cooperated with Ptolemy, made himself master of Babylon. So, the year 312 marks the beginning of what's called the Seleucid Empire, which inaugurated a calendar long in use among the Jews. In fact, is still employed by some Jews in parts of the East. So, the calendar um, being more based um, on the old Babylonian calendar. Okay. So, um, at the Battle of Ipsus in 301, Antiochus was killed and um, presented Ptolemy I. The opportunity to seize Judea, but Seleucus won the victory and ruled over Syria from his capital in Antioch. Okay, so um, Josephus writes about this a bunch, so you get a bunch of history in there. You get, um, there's some other um, um, Egyptian histories that, that speak about this as well. So for, the, for our purposes, again, the big thing to remember is that right now, um, Egypt is ruled by the Ptolemies, okay, and the descendants of Ptolemy. Um, the area of Babylon okay, and Mesopotamia is ruled by um, the Seleucids. Judea is kind of stuck in the middle. So it gets conquered and goes back and forth okay, throughout this time. Okay? So... Um, and they experience very different things in, uh, in that time period. As well as, um, as we're going to see here in a second, this actually promotes a further dispersion of Jewish communities around that part of the world. Okay? So, um, skipping several paragraphs... Um, after a quote from the letter of Aristeus, so probably on the next page, um, it says this, 
Judeans were to be found in large numbers in Ptolemaic Egypt, as, as is indicated by the Egyptian inscriptions and papyri. Okay, so you have Egyptian records talking about Judeans there. Okay. While many Judeans had been in Egypt before the time of the rule of the Ptolemies, it's still true that Ptolemy the first Soter, Logi, brought many to Egypt. So he actually brings some. Um, when he has control of Judea, he actually brings some down into Egypt. Okay? The Judeans enjoyed the same rights of autonomy that they had under the Persians and were allowed to live in peace and practice their religious and cultural traditions. The central government concerned itself only with the collection of taxes and did not interfere in internal affairs. The high priests were permitted to administer local affairs as they had done under the Persian rule. Okay, so they're basically allowed to live autonomously as long as they pay their taxes. Okay? So, going on, the, Ptol the early Ptolemies were capable and enlightened rulers with absolute and unlimited power over Egypt and its subjects. Though their own personal lives were immoral and dis... Yeah, that's like an understatement. If you ever read that sentence. These, they were horrible. Um, during the rule of the Ptolemies, Egypt became one of the most important intellectual centers of the Hellenistic world. No attempt was made to Hellenize the natives. So this is kind of an interesting thing. Just like with the Judeans, they let them operate kind of according to their own culture and religion. They did the same thing with the Egyptians. Okay? But they ruled with an iron fist over Egypt. Okay? And they did this, and they, um, again, um, the religious and the cultural traditions um, blossomed. Okay? So this is, again, where we get Alexander, or the city of Alexandria in Egypt that builds its library, that ends up becoming this great center of learning was because the Ptolemies um, promoted that heavily. Okay. So um, that next paragraph talks about, uh, well, at the same time, um, the Ptolemies preferred Greeks over against the natives. Okay, So there was a benefit to be of a Greek descendant and not an Egyptian or a Jewish. They had more privileges. Okay. Now going on again, Alexandria, Egypt became famous as the home of the scholars, Greeks and learning. It was claimed that at one time no less than 14,000 students pursued studies in conjunction with the Museum and Library of Alexandria. That's huge um, in today in the yeah. ancient world. And it's still yeah. not a bad size for a university in yeah. days. Okay. Okay. Scientific research characterized the endeavors of many scholars through the maintenance of botanical and zoological gardens by the museum and by dissection and astronomical uh, laboratories. Okay, so from 319 to 198, so over 100 years, right, the Ptolemies controlled Judea. While they were in power, it was, a, uh, it was a propitious time for the Judeans in the realm. However, in the wars that ensued between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, soldiers of the Seleucids trampled Judea underfoot. Greek influence was strong in Judea, though Hellenism was weak in Jerusalem and the surrounding vicinity. The Ptolemies... The Greek kings of Egypt were following, and then you have a list of them. Now, um, um, we're going to skip most of these kings. You guys can go back and read if you want. Um, here's, here's a couple of notes on this, okay? So while the, as the Ptolemies ruled, okay, they were fairly um, benevolent towards the Judeans. They let them do kind of their own thing. They did not try to make them Greek. But the influence of the Greek culture, again, in that broader area was very heavy, but not in Jerusalem. Okay. And in Jerusalem, the ethnic Jewish culture kind of became, started to become this kind of holdout and strong point. Now, the part of the reason why this matters is this, around this time, is where you're going to start to have the beginnings of the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Right? which helps to explain once we start to read in the New Testament. Right, They're very concerned with the ethnic purity, not just ethnic, but cultural purity of Judaism as they, as they see it. Right? And this is part of the reason why, is because now they're, they're being bounced back and forth, and they're, you know, they have for hundreds and hundreds of years 
the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and now they're being passed hands back and forth between um, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, and then eventually they have a little bit of independence, and then the Romans come in. And so, kind of as a defensive mechanism, it's we're going to bottle ourselves up and hide ourselves away as best that we can. And preserve our culture, our language, our religion, and that sort of thing. And what that ends up leading to really is a self righteousness that Jesus condemns the Pharisees and the Sadducees for. Right? You think you're better because you've got the right pedigree. Right? Well, that's, and Jesus is saying, well, that's not what it's about, right? It's about faith. Now, on, on the flip side of that, you have the danger of incorporating all these other cultures, and then you end up losing your faith. Right? Now, again, this um, does this kind of thing have some um, importance and application for us today? Well, oh, yeah, it does. Right? You bet it does. So there's this balance to be had where we can't, we as Christians, we aren't just to live as people, as the rest of the world and the sinful world is, right? Can we incorporate and, and have that as part of our culture? Well, sure. Um, um, but there's a balancing act between that. On the other end, can we hide ourselves away and try to preserve that? And there's groups, there's Christian groups that have. Again, yeah. things like the Amish, mm -hmm. right? Um, to a certain degree, the Mennonites. Some of these are also descendants of uh, Reformation time of the Anabaptists. Okay? And there's also a big promotion um, that, well, promotion. There's been a big discussion for the last um, four years or so, um, um, kind of put forth by this guy named Rob, Rob Dreher, who wrote a book called The Benedict Option. And he wrote that um, in 2016. Seven. It came out in January, I think, of 2017. And the reason why I know that is because he says in his foreword, he writes this with the full expectation that, um, that Trump was not going to win the election, right? and that the culture was going to take a harder turn away from Christianity. And the Benedict option then follows after a monk called Benedict, right? Um, one of the famous um, monks in the early church, um, a whole order, monastic order, um, is, um, was created and revolves around him, the Benedictines, right? So you have monks and nuns in the Benedictine order. Um, there's a, this is called a rule, um, which is basically a guidebook on if you're going to be a Benedictine, this is how you act, right? And so um, um, for a lot of uh, Christian church history, you have these different groups of, of people kind of following their founders. You have the Benedictines, you have the Augustinians, mm -hmm. right? Um, Luther was an Augustinian. Right? You, have a Fra you have the Franciscans. You have um, the Jesuits, right? So you have these different groups like this that kind of come up. So, Benedict basically, and part of his um, promotion was um, you escape the world, you create an isolated community. And really what this comes down to is how do we live, as Jesus says, how do we live in the world but not of the world? Right? What does that look like? So there's a lot of discussion that has come around because of that book. It's a decent book. He's, um, he's Eastern Orthodox. Um, but it's uh, writing about a Roman Catholic saint. Um, um, the East doesn't observe him this or recognize recognize him in the same kind of way. Um, but it's an interesting book. It has some um, good things. stimulates a lot of thought and discussion on how, um, on how do we take <coughs> these examples from, from olden times and apply them to our culture and our times today. What's the name of the author again? Um, Rod Dreher. Rod? Rod. Rod. R-O-D. Dreher. D-R-E-H-E-R. -E -E I actually read the book. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Um, didn't the Catholic Church embrace that to some degree over yeah. the last five years or so and had little clusters of... Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, um, living in our area, we see some of this because the Mormons do a little bit of this as well. 
they buy up this big plot of land, they build their steakhouse, and then they build the houses, they sell a part of their land to the school district, and says, hey, part of the deal is we can put our seminary right next to the school. Right. Right? And then you promote those houses to other Mormon families, and then you get these little pocket communities. Okay? So, the Mormons do this. Jewish communities still do this. Right? Um, um, you see um, some Muslim communities. Just, um, my wife's from Bakersfield. There's little pockets of Sikh communities that do the same kind of thing, too, right? So you have these cultures that do this. So this isn't unheard of. Um, and so this is um, something that, um, yeah, it's kind of stimulates some conversation on how can Christians do this with a life that is centered around um, the church, worship and devotion, schooling and education. Those, um, those kind of are the, and then acts of service. Those are kind of the big things. Um, and there's some there's some merit um, in that for sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, what is the basic foundation of agrarian? I've heard that. Ag agriculture. 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 Really? So agrarian just means agriculture. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because I've heard it said that um, the the foundation of like Billy Graham and his faith was agrarian, and I didn't understand. That would mean a kind of a ground up. Ground. Grassroots. Oh, yeah, that's it's applied that way. That's what it means. Yeah. They're trying to be tricky. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just Thank so, but the Lutherans wouldn't want to do something like that because our whole premise is to go out and to go out. So and, and, you, know, <coughs> you say so the Lutherans wouldn't want to. Yes and no. Depends on what <laughs> <laughs> Missouri City. So here's an here's an interesting an interesting bit of history. Um, if anybody listens to issues, etc., this was just talked about. Um, I believe it was um, Cameron McKenzie, who's a professor at the Fort Wayne Seminary, was a guest on there and talked about um, about some of these things. Todd Peppercorn, who's a pastor in, Cal in Northern California, um, um, just had an article published on the same kind of thing on micro synods in the in the Lutheran Church. So if you go back and look at Lutheranism in America. There's a whole bunch of um, small synods or communities. They join together and form bigger ones. They have breakoffs for different reasons. Some of that's cultural and language-based. Some of it's not. So that's why, like Missouri Synod and the Wisconsin Synod, are are Germanic, but from different parts of Germany. Mm -hmm. right? You have the ELCA churches with those joined in the in 1989, something like that. There were more Scandinavian churches coming together, um, um, but not the Norwegian. Well, you had liberal Norwegians and conservative Norwegians. The conservative jo Norwegians more joined together with the Germans that made up the Wisconsin Synod. Okay, so you have the Evangelical Lutheran Synod and the Wisconsin Lutheran Synod Fellowship. We have um, we have members here um, at our church that have connections back to the Evangelical Lutheran Center, um, and, um, and we have family members. I wasn't talking about you, Chris, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of Chris's mother's side of the family um, as, um, are Norwegian Lutherans of the conservative strategy. Um, the, um, uh, so you have some of these different kinds of movements and different kinds of things, So, in, but in the beginning of the Missouri Synod, you have, um, um, there's two kind of big movements, and one is really, really concerned with getting the message right. So doctrinal purity, almost to an extreme sometimes, mm -hmm. was the thing. We got to be right on every little thing, mm -hmm. right? You had another group that was heavily, heavily emphasized, you got to get the message out, and when you put those two things together, that, that um, sometimes has worked really well and sometimes has not. But you'll still hear that kind of language in, in some um, official publications of the Missouri Synod is. Um, uh, Pastor Kellerman, for anybody who remembered him, he died several years ago now, but he used to say this a lot. Missouri, get the message right and get the message out. 
Right? But if you don't do, you got to do both. Yeah. If you don't do one, then you're not doing it right. Yeah. Okay. So, this is it. There is a balancing act. But when you see um, migration, is when you see a lot of these kinds of things come into play. So, and when immigrants came over to the United States from Germany, it was very common for the German immigrants to create these pocket German communities. Right? Very calm. The same way with the Scandinavians. The same way with the Irish. Right? I mean, this happened everywhere. You create these pocket communities where your culture and your language continue. But America is different. Because America isn't about just we come over and we create our own, at least historically. Right? Um, it's, and it's not about isolation. But, but assimilation, right? What's on our points? Right? In Latin. Right? The, the, the Florida, the Suna, right? Out of many, one. Right? So this is a different, I mean, America's a different ideology and a different mindset historically than anywhere else. Because it intentionally says, don't, you know, yes, you want to keep this, but um, but we're also out, we're also creating this out of this great experiment, right? We're gonna create this unique culture into ourselves. That's a compilation of all these things. So, um, so you do have some of these little pockets coming out, but there was always an emphasis, and this is really a, an important thing for the Missouri Synod. Missouri Synod has always had a very, very strong evangelistic emphasis. Mm -hmm. Now, where does that evangelism start when the Germans come over? Well, the easiest place is let's go find where the other Germans are. Right? Because we share the we share the same language. We share some commonalities and cultures. So they went out and they started trying to connect with other German groups. Okay? Um, there was also a big, big missionary emphasis um, toward the Indian reservations. Right? So this was a heavy thing, and it's almost forgotten in our in our current mindset of the Missouri Synod, but we still have some of this kind of stuff. So some of our elder male ladies went down to um, Navajo Nation several years ago. Um, the Missouri Synod, German Lutheran missionaries have been involved with the Navajos for 150 years or more in various capacities. So this was a very common thing to um, introduce. Yes? Uh, the Wisconsin Synod apparently was... Um heavily involved with Apaches because one of my okay. friends was 100% Apache. She was okay. a Lutheran school yeah. teacher, went to New Ulm, well, Minnesota. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 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 So um, you see this kind of thing um, happening a lot. So anyway, it's not. this isn't new, okay? and this isn't new for us, both in our, our American context nor in the histo broader historical context. Context. The challenges that the church faces are not new, and when we rest on the fact that um, that um, the church will remain no matter what, because um, as the bride of Christ to preserve the church, um, it, it takes a little bit of the pressure off too. Now that doesn't mean that Zion Lutheran Church will stand forever. It doesn't mean that Lutheranism will stand doesn't mean that our country or Christianity in our country will stand for it. But the church will. So, and if you think it's bad, just go back and read through um, read through Elijah's time. Right? And you can sit in your little cave and say, poor me, I'm the only one left. Right? Nobody else believes. And God will say, no, look. There's people, right? There's all these people over here. Still. They'll pick on him. So, um, okay, so last thing on the Ptolemies is um, uh, who is the most famous Egyptian queen? Cleopatra. <laughs> what, what lineage do you think Cleopatra comes from? The Ptolemies, right? So Cleopatra is Greek, right? There's probably... Some Egyptian mixed in there too, at some point. But she is of the line of the Ptolemies. Okay. So we're gonna um, 
<clears throat> We're going to skip some pages here. You can see some maps in that handout. You have your book. They, all, they have some similar maps as well. Um, I don't remember which page. But kind of divides up and shows you a little bit of the different kingdoms. In the handout, you have um, one of these maps has different Jewish communities alongside the Nile. You see there's a lot of them <coughs> over here. There's Jewish settlements um, in Asia Minor, which is, again, uh, modern-day Turkey. Okay? Um, you start to see the spread of these communities going all the way over into Italy as well, and then the Roman. Okay? So, the next section okay, is um, in the handout called the divided rule, the Judeans under the Seleucids. So 311 to 164. So again, there's overlap. Judea's kind of in between, right? So they get conquered by one, then conquered by another, and they get mistreated at times by everything. Okay? So, um, going on here, um, um, right at the top of this section, it says, as noted above, Alexander the Great's empire is divided up by his generals. Among them was Seleucus I, Nicator, who established a great dynasty of rulers, including the following, and you have this list. Okay? Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, is especially important for understanding the experiences and subsequent attitudes of God's people during the time between the Testaments. So we'll get to him. He was an evil, evil man. Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. Epiphanes. Okay, so he ruled from 175 to 164. Um, um, he uh, didn't like the Judeans. He didn't like the religion. So he imagined that um, him going into Jerusalem, burning and pillaging, going up to the, um, to the temple, bringing in a pig, and sacrificing a pig in the altar. Oh. And um, dedicating then the temple to to other gods, yeah. and um, which kind of sparked a revolution. We're going to get to this in Maccabees, the Maccabean revolt, which um, leads to um, this little legend about a candle and the oil not going out for eight days, called a menorah, right? And at the end of this, and where they celebrate the rededicating of the temple, they call that holiday Hanukkah. So Hanukkah, just keep this in mind, we'll get through this more. Hanukkah is not a Jewish Easter. It has nothing to do with anything even remotely related. Or, I mean, Christmas. Yeah, Christmas. It's celebrated oftentimes in December, but it has nothing to do with anything anything at all even closer related to the Messiah or to the birth of Jesus or anything. It's about the rededication of the temple after um, Antiochus defines it. Okay. So, it is more of a 4th of July celebration. Okay. Alright, so, I want to keep going. Um, so, we're going to get to him um, a little bit later in this time. And uh, um, this certainly is going to wrap into the Apocrypha stuff because this is where we have a lot of historical records. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, going on. The house of Seleucid imitated the example of Alexander in that they founded as many as 40 cities by which, um, or by means of which they hoped to Hellenize the territory subject to them. Other important Hellenic centers were Antioch, Pisidia, and Seleucia on the Tigris, Apamea, um, Laodicea, Edessa, and Berea were also founded as centers of Greek culture. So, here's the difference. The Ptolemies didn't try to make every Hellenized. They tried to make everybody Greek. The Seleucids did. Okay? So you have two opposite ways of ruling and trying to maintain order in their, their various um, territories. Okay? Um, part of where this comes in is in the next paragraph, Daniel 11 sets forth events in this period affecting the Judeans in the second century BC. So Daniel's prophesying about these things that are going to happen. Okay. So, um, so that's just kind of your basic. There's a chart over here 
um, that talks a little bit um, or kind of outlines some of the, the rulers, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. There's just one section I want to touch on. Um, <clears throat> well, no, I don't. <clears throat> We're going to come back to that. If you jump to the next section, um, called the Judeans under the Maccabees, 165 to 134. And we're going to go back historically, we're going to go back in time um, later on, probably next Sunday, to look more at Antiochus IV. Huh? Page 22, in the handout, yeah. So we're going to back up next week and we're going to look at more of this stuff and this will tie into um, to some of the apocryphal things. Um, for now, I just kind of want to give this broader overview. So, now you have the Judeans under the Maccabees. So, in this first paragraph, the opposition of the Jews to the efforts of Hellenization finally broke into open revolt. Okay, so the Seleucids, again, are trying to make them, or Hellenize them, make them more Greek. Um, and now it leads to a revolt led by the family of the Maccabees. The revolt grew into a determined struggle for complete political independence. The climax of the struggle between the Jews and the Syrians <coughs> came when Apelles, an officer of the Antiochus IV of Pythians, entered the village of Modin in the hills between Jerusalem and Joppa. So he commanded Matthias of the Asmonean line to bring a sacrifice to the heathen god on an altar set up for this purpose. So Apelles made a special appeal for the aged priest to comply because his example would do much to influence the people. He was assured that he would be given position, honor, and wealth, and be numbered among the friends of the king. To this command, Matthias responded, Far be it from us to desert the law and the ordinances. We will not obey the king's words by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. Mm -hmm. He refused to comply. When another local headman came forward to make the sacrifice, Matthias struck him down and killed him. He also killed Apelles and destroyed the altar. So Matthias then called upon those who were loyal to the Jewish faith to follow him as he fled to the hills. His sons and those zealous for the law followed him. At first, the band was small, but it kept increasing. Matthias became their leader in conducting a type of guerrilla warfare. First, Maccabees described their activity as follows. Emerging suddenly from their hiding places in the mountains, they would fall upon neighboring towns and villages, destroying idols and heathen altars, forcing circumcision upon the apostate Jews, and reestablishing the synagogue. Person zealous for the law, called the Cassidines, swelled their ranks. Marching up and down Judea, these patriots waged their war of purification, carefully avoiding the larger cities, hiding by day and attacking by night. Okay. Now, when we get to the New Testament time, this is now the beginnings of what of the zealots. Right? So the zealots now. Uh, by Jesus' time, are these group of Jews that are zealous, right, very passionate about a political um, independence and a national independence from underneath the rule of any other of any foreigners. Okay. They also then are very militaristic. Right? So um, this again, this time period, we see the rise of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots each kind of concern with how do we preserve our religion and our culture, and each answering that in different ways. And then by the time Jesus comes, and they're all looking for this Messiah, right? And this is why Jesus doesn't fit into the mold of any of them. So, um, we're going to come back to Judas Maccabeus later. Um, um, skip to the next section. The Judeans under the Hasmoneans from 134 to 63. Okay? Um, the Hasmoneans. So, um, with the death of Simon, we'll get back to him. Linda, that's the question you asked earlier on who's Simon. So, we're going to actually we'll figure that out as we go on. So, a period of 30 years during which five of the Maccabees rendered valiant service came to an end. They achieved great things during these three decades. The result was that the small city-state of Jerusalem, harassed by its enemies and threatened with complete annihilation, had grown into a nation. 
Israel had an army that her enemies respected and feared. They had cleared the temple of all pagan abominations. Right? The abomination that causes desolation. Okay, so that's, that's part of this. The Jews, once again, had a high priest and a hereditary prince and were enjoying religious liberty and almost complete political independence. John Hyrcanus, the son of Simon, Maccabeus, established a ruling dynasty. So you have this dynasty here now as they enjoy this kind of political independence for about 70 years. Okay? Just a little bit here. Um, although Ptolemy had planned to exterminate all of his descendants, Simon's descendants, son John escaped. Being warned of Ptolemy's murderous design, John proceeded to Jerusalem, assumed the dignity of the high priest in the place of his father. He did not inherit the title of king, for even Simon had not permitted the use, um, to use the designation of king. One of the Hasmoneans had applied this title to himself, but it's doubtful if the people ever acknowledged him as such. Okay. So, you start to have this now, and you have this hereditary dynasty now that gets set up. Um, skip the whole next paragraph, okay? And we'll start um, on the following paragraph. So, Hyrcanus do not treat the Cassidim well. So again, these are the zealots, the militaristic zealots, right? Failing to appreciate the important role they played in the supporters of the Maccabeans from the time of Matthias to the death of Simon, the antagonistic attitude of um, Hyrcanus over against the Cassidian resulted in eternal tension. From this time forward, the existence of three sects dated. The Pharisees, who likely came out of the Cassidians, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. Mm -hmm. Who are the Essenes? Do you know? They're the, a monastic group that kind of separated out the desert. I think the Dead Sea Scrolls might have come from there. There you go. So they're almost a monastic group. They separate. And these are the where the Dead Sea Scrolls come in. So, um, so you have a little bit of a rule here, um, and then um, keep going uh, to the last of that section. You're going to have a, um, um, a uh, map. <clears throat> yeah, there we go. What page is that on? Page 30. So you have a map of the Hasmonean... Um, conquest. So this is um, this is the extent of that um, of that control. Now until the Romans come. Okay. So um, the next page: the Judeans under the Romans. Okay. Um, in the first paragraph here, um, the Roman period begins. With 63 BC, it extends to the suppression of the rebellion of Bar Kokhba by, by Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian, and the disintegration of the life of the Judeans. For the New Testament, soon this period ends with the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in the year 70. Okay. When the Jews were obedient and submissive to the laws of the Roman world, the Romans treated them with consideration. They recognized Judea. Um, Judaism as one of the licensed religions in the Roman world. They required the Jews to pay a tribute that, though small and not burdensome, the Jews nevertheless resented. They had their own Sanhedrin, a judicial and legislative body. So that's where you get the Sanhedrin beginning as well. A judicial and legislative body and were permitted to settle civil and minor cases, not since Persian domination were the Jews given such fair treatment as under Roman rule. Yet the extremists, known as the Zealots, kept Israel in constant unrest and provoked the Jews to break out in their rebellion a number of times. The years between 63 B.C. and 43 B.C. were troubled ones for the Near Eastern world, especially between 53 and 43. Caesar, so that's Julius, Caesar, and Pompey had become estranged in 49. There was civil war between them until Caesar defeated Pompey at Orsalus in Thessaly. He was later killed in Egypt. Okay, um, Pompey was right. And who do you think? Um, so he goes down to Egypt, right? So you have Julius Caesar. Okay, 
Ptolemy, they have a falling out. They're kind of co co rulers almost of Rome. Right. They have a falling out. There's a civil war that ensues. Okay. Um, Ptolemy, or not Ptolemy, but um, uh, Pompey loses. He runs down to Egypt. Okay. The Ptolemies are still the rulers of Egypt at this time, and are now under Roman rule. So he goes down there, and then he's later killed. And in the struggle between them for the control of Rome, Aristobulus II and his sons die or sided with Caesar. So he's the, um, one of the rulers there. So Aristobulus II was poisoned on his way to Judea with troops furnished by Caesar. In 44 BC, Roman sinners murdered Caesar. And after this war ensued between Brutus and Cassius on one side and Mark and Anthony and Octavian on the other. Okay, so Julius Caesar, before he dies, has a little fling with who? Cleopatra, right? Who's down in Egypt around this time. Okay, then Caesar dies. Okay, Caesar's murdered. And you have this war between Brutus and Cassius on one side, Mark Anthony and Octavian, who are basically supporters of Julius. Right? They end up winning. And then Mark Anthony has a little fling with Cleopatra. Right? And then Mark Anthony and Octavian don't get along. And Octavian wins. And in honor of all this, Octavian changes his name to what? Caesar Augustus. And this is where you have the change from Rome, from the Roman <coughs> Republic, to the Roman Empire. Okay? So this is where that change occurs, is, kind of starts with Julius Caesar, because they're afraid Julius Caesar is going to make himself an emperor. Now, right? Now, what flies upon the Uber challenge of peace the king of the is this ambition? This ambition should be named Stone Stone. Okay? So, that's Shakespeare. Right? So, you rocks, you stones, you worthless, senseless, senseless things, do you not pop it? Good job. <laughs> Steve. So, <laughs> Julius Caesar, they're afraid, it's, it's a great irony of history, right? They're afraid he's going to make himself the sole ruler of anything. Yeah. As a result of the war that ensues, because he's murdered, the guy that ends up winning makes himself the emperor and, and changes everything. Of course. Right? Sure. Yeah. And in part he does so, so um, Octavian is the nephew of Julius Caesar, right? So they're related. Um, and um, this, of course, has incredible significance because <coughs> how does New Chapter 1 start? In the days of Caesar Augustus. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so. And we got all this stuff, too. Yeah. And the name of August comes just like the name of July. Yeah. Comes from February Julius. gave up all the days to get 31 to each of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, this is. Um, uh, from this time now, as well, when the Judeans are under the Romans, okay, carry back a little bit to the Hasmonean time and a little bit of the independence that they have. This now is also setting the scene for kings like Herod the Great, okay, who ends up um, basically being in bed with the Romans and not a very good um, religious or moral person. Um, but as far as kings go, at this time of the period, he was a pretty darn good one. Right? Um, but religiously, not so much. So, we're, we'll get into some of this kind of stuff now, and some of this history. We could spend weeks and weeks and weeks. We're not going to. But, we're going to get into a little bit of this history now, this is laying the groundwork as well for the Apocrypha, because a lot of these Apocrypha, again, remember, these Apocryphal sections are all written in Greek, not in Hebrew. The Jews of Jesus' day 
are using the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but not the apocryphal sections. They recognize these things are different and not the inspired word of God, while at the same time valuing them very highly. Okay? So, we're now going to see as we go throughout this as well, kind of as a side note to this, how historically how Lutherans have treated the Apocrypha in a very similar way until about the last 100 years in the English-speaking world. Okay? And um, so we'll get into a little bit of that kind of stuff too. Then, um, just as a quick note, my plan originally was just to kind of stop with doing this kind of stuff here and then jump into the book of Acts. But um, some comments from other people is we might keep going with this sort of thing and just do this kind of big historical overview of, of things. So um, that'll still that'll probably be like a month away by the time we get to that. But we'll revisit that idea um, to see what um, how you guys want to handle the truth and stuff. Okay? All right. So um, let's close with prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you once more that you that you preserve your people even through um, through wars, through um, conflicts of cultures, through changes of language, and the sinfulness that just arises from all of us. So we pray that you would continue to preserve us as well in this true faith, that you would um, keep us as your people and that you would lead us to be good and faithful witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name we pray. Amen.